Good afternoon, folks. Hi. I want to welcome you all to this beautiful sunny day, which we ordered up special for you. Uh, before we begin, I want to make you all aware that we are going to be filmed by Manchester Public Television. So if you're in the witness protection program, you might want to scoot out of here right now okay. because you may wind up on television. Uh, welcome. My name is John Clayton. For those of you who are lucky enough not to know me, I'm the executive director of the Manchester Historic Association and this, our Milliard Museum, which we happily encourage you to visit after the walking tour is over at, at my invitation, so there's no charge involved. Uh, apply what you just spent toward your admission and you're good. We've been trying to do more and more events outdoors uh, for obvious reasons. If you haven't seen it, we recently did two walking tours of both the Valley Cemetery and Mount Cavalry Cemetery for those native West Siders here. Uh, what we did is we worked with the Majestic Theater to try to add a little emphasis to it. And we hired 10 actors, uh, men and women, who portrayed characters from Manchester's historic past at the site of their graves. It was an amazing experience and one that we've never quite done in that fashion because of COVID. So what we did was with the 10 actors, we put our guests into groups of 10. That's the governor's allocated model for that kind of a thing back then. And they got the script from one actor, we rang a school bell and everybody moved on one group. So we had 10 pods of 10 moving through. Uh, it's been a great way to engage with people and we're finding that people really starve for this kind of stuff. We turned away at least 10 people for this afternoon tour to try to keep the numbers down to something that's safe. So we're grateful that you took the time to come. I see you all have stickers on, which is a good sign. Uh, take them home, put them on the mirror, you know, just as a reminder of the great time you had here. So this is going to be a walking tour of the outdoor milliard. We normally would be able to go into the Wombeck building and into Dean Kamen's DECA building, but under the circumstances, they've asked us not to try to do that. So uh, we'll have to do it another time if that's okay. So as a foundational point of this entire program, you need to know that in 1831, a bunch of wealthy Boston businessmen, in fact, they call themselves the Boston Associates, looked north to this area that was known as Dairyfield, and they gave birth to a vision. They bought 1,500 acres of beautiful farmland divided by a powerful river with the express intent of creating an industrial utopia where people would want to come and live and work around the manufacture of textiles. It was an audacious vision, but they made it happen. And for better than a century, uh, this mill yard has been the economic backbone of the community of Manchester and in many ways, the state of New Hampshire. So you'll get to see it and hear all the stories behind the stories as we walk through. At its peak, the company employed more than 17,000 workers right here in this mill yard. They didn't have subsidiaries in other towns. It was all focused here. They produced more than 470 miles of fabric every day coming out of these mills which last time I checked is about from here to Washington. So they were prolific, they had great foresight, they were very nimble in their ability to adapt to changing circumstances until they weren't. And that's from the story, it's really interesting. So we're gonna make our way north here. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to speak without a mask. I'll stay as far back as you need me to. If you can hear me, please raise your hand and let me know. I'll try to project for you and not blow out the microphone on the television camera at the same time. Okay, we're gonna head this way. <laughs> to be out. Sure. <laughs> this is an active roadway. It's very slow, but just be aware there could be cars coming from in front of you or from behind you. <clears throat> so as much as the available land here in the area known as Derryfield was important uh, to those uh, Boston associates, it was the Merrimack River that really made them choose this place. In the early days of the textile industry, water power, hydropower was the only way they can generate what they needed uh, to manufacture all those miles and miles of fabric I talked about. So they diverted the river into two industrial canals. They built a wing dam and their vision was to use these two industrial canals to power the mills on this very gentle downslope that makes up the mill yard. <clears throat> the upper canal, so-called, uh, is now Bedford Street. And these canals were not filled in until the early 1970s. This commercial street was the lower canal. This is actually part of the original retaining wall that kept the canals channeled so they could be used to funnel into the spots to generate power. So the way it worked is that when they were building this, uh, these canals, or digging the canals, they weren't building them, uh, what they did is uh, they installed what we call pen stocks. If you went into the museum to pay for today's walking tour, 
you were looking right at one of those penstocks. It's at least as tall as I am. And you can imagine the volume of water that was coming through those things simply through force of gravity. So it would come in from the upper canal into the penstock and into the mill. It would hit a blade turbine. You all know what a turbine is. And the hip bone's connected to the leg bone. Yep. So through a series of belts and cogs, all of those things were interconnected. So as the water came in, all the looms would work. There was no electricity at that time. So it was a pretty remarkable thing. I described their plan as audacious, and that's part of the indication of how audacious this plan was. In the early 1830s and early 1840s, uh, Amosgeg benefited mightily from the influx of Irish folks who were fleeing the hunger in Ireland. So it was those Irish immigrants who did most of the grunt work, if you will, uh, with no power tools, no backhoes, no tractors, uh, to dig the canals, excavate them, and install those penstocks, which again, you can get a much better view if you visit the museum when we're done. So as these Irish folks were coming here, they were getting jobs, they were getting food, something they were not getting at home. So in those early days of what was then Deerfield, Derryfield, it was a largely Irish population not counting the few Scots-Irish who had come here originally. Amoscape's plan was not to build a mill, it was to build another mill and another mill and another mill. So they became pioneers of necessity with what we in New Hampshire today call workforce development. It's a big issue for us here. Apparently we're the second oldest state in the nation. Nothing to do with me, mind you. Uh, and so we need to bring younger people here to come and live and work in this environment that we've created. Amoscape had the same problem because once that first mill was filled, this farm town, everybody was working at the mill. So who's gonna populate the next one and the next one and the next one? At that time, family farms in the maritime provinces of Canada were failing. It was a blight that no one could put their finger on. It may have been similar to what was happening in Ireland, but regardless, if you owned a family farm in Canada and you didn't have a good crop for three years, let's say, the Canadian government would seize your land for failure to pay your taxes. And that was happening in great enough numbers that the Amoscake folks recognized it. They put agents on trains leaving from Manchester, Montreal, and Quebec City, and they'd fan out through the countryside by horse and buggy and visit these farms that were posted as having been seized by the government, invite those residents and their families to come and live and work in Manchester with the promise of a clean place to live, a good wage, and the design of the city, which was done by a 19-year-old engineer named Ezekiel Straw, was built in such a way that it would be conducive to clean, healthy living. They set aside land for parks and playgrounds and churches and schools. So this city became stratified economically in a lightning flash. So now we have all the Irish workers here, the Franco-Americans come in, and they, at one time Manchester was more than 50% French speaking because of that influx of Franco-Americans here into Amoscape. So that's part of the company's plan as they go forward. Now we're gonna start making textiles. Anybody wearing Levi's? <clears throat> the denim for the first Levi's ever manufactured was manufactured right here at Amoscape. That's a little tidbit, you can Google it. Yeah. I know you're all gonna fact check me anyway, but that's one you can take to the bank. Okay. So they had a contract with Levi Strauss, and again, when is this happening? What's that football team in San Francisco called? 49. Yeah, so 1849 when the California gold rush was going on, workers, miners, were going in to the mines with gabardine slacks, and they'd come out with their pants in shreds. So they needed a heavy, durable material. Amoskeg denim was just the ticket for them, and Levi Strauss is the one who came up with the no notion of the rivets. You probably noticed. So these incredibly sturdy clothes were manufactured from the start here. And it was recommended back then that you not wash your denim jeans. Yeah, Ever. Awesome. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> they felt, well, now it's all the thing, right? If you want the faded jeans, but back then they, it was recommended that they not be washed. So something else to think about as we make our way. But again, this is part of the actual retaining wall from the lower canal. And you'll get some sense of perspective as we move through the mill yard as to what that was all about. Cindy? I've always heard that there was a certain uh, traditional animosity between the uh, Irish and the French. Did it start from there or when they came in and they felt replaced or what happened? No, it actually traces back to that because what happened is, you know, the Irish fought long and hard to get a, a livable wage here in Manchester given all the physical work they were doing. And when the French Canadians came in, they were destitute. They needed jobs. They were told they would have jobs, so they would settle for less money and the Irish had that antipathy toward them because they felt that they were lowering the standards here in what eventually would become Manchester. Uh, that happened in 1840. Uh, a gentleman, no, I'm sorry, 1810. A gentleman named Samuel Blodgett had a vision to build a canal that would bypass the Amoskeg Falls. 
and that needs some expansion. The Emiskeg Falls uh, was not a simple great waterfall like Niagara Falls. The river, the Merrimack, dropped 50 feet in about a quarter of a mile. So it was a series of rapids and eddies and chutes that made the river run so fiercely. Uh, Cotton Mather, everybody's favorite Protestant cleric, came here and described them as the hideous falls at Amiskeg. He came in the spring when the snow is melting in the mountains and we have our rainy season and the river runs at its most fierce. It's called the Freshette. And that's what native people saw when they decided to come to this area. It was the Merrimack River in general, but the Amiskeg Falls in particular that brought them here. The word Amiskeg means place of many fish. And the reason they called it that is because of the falls. The Merrimack is populated by anadromous fish. Fact check that too. Uh, these anadromous fish were salmon and shad and alewives, and they were populated or spawned north of us around Franklin or Tilton. The Merrimack is formed when the Pemigewasset and Winnipesaukee rivers come together, and that was the breeding ground for the salmon and the shad and the alewives. Their instincts upon birth tell them to go to the ocean. So they would swim downriver with the current and go out into the sea in Newburyport, Massachusetts. That's where the Merrimack empties into the Atlantic. And their instincts, as they grow and mature, tell them to go back when it's time to spawn, to have their young to go back where they in fact were spawned. So whatever genetic switch flipped, they would come up river during the spring, swimming against the heavy current all the way up from Newburyport to this area. They had to get over the falls. So I'm seeing a lot of bears snatching salmon out of the air on television lately, I don't know why. Uh, but that's exactly the scene that would have played out here in Manchester. Uh, the native people would wait as the fish tried to get over the falls they would often exhaust themselves and come back to rest in the pools below the falls. And that's where the Native American people, the Abenakis in our case, uh, would take their weirs and canoes and go out on the water and literally harvest the bounty of the river. Folklore tells us that you could have walked across the river on the backs of the fish at that time when the indigenous people were making this their home. So the Emiskeg Falls were a benefit for the native people. They were a detriment to uh, commerce because you couldn't move goods up and down the river unless you get to the falls, you haul everything out, you dredge it the quarter mile, and then put them back in. <clears throat> so a very smart young man named Samuel Blodgett said, I want to build a canal that will bypass the falls. He went to the state of New Hampshire and asked if they would help fund it. Anybody know what would have happened there? Yeah, this is New Hampshire. We don't pay for anything. So how do we raise money in New Hampshire? Lotteries. Samuel Blodgett in 1797 held the first lottery in America. He sold chances like a 50-50 raffle at a baseball game. I need 9,000 pounds to make this canal, so I'm selling 18,000 pounds worth of lottery tickets. And he very publicly awarded the prizes. Half of the money went back to those people who took a chance on buying a lottery ticket, which is ironic because in 1963, New Hampshire became the first state in the country to have a legal lottery. Samuel Blodgett beat him by 150 years. So when I say he was smart, he was. At the fall construction, he, had to, he went bankrupt twice and had to keep doing the lottery thing. Uh, but when it was, was ready to be opened, he said, I see a city on the banks of this river that shall one day rival Manchester in England as an industrial power. That was in 1807. He was the first man to go through the, uh, the canal. Uh, the state made about the equivalent of $12 million in fees, even though they didn't pay to build it. They charged uh, royalties for you to use the canal. And it sparked a cottage industry of canal boats. The boats could only be as wide as the locks in the canal would allow. So all of a sudden, these perfectly sized boats are coming out. They would literally pull up river. And when it was time to go home, it was a lot easier to go with the flow in every sense of the word. So that was Blodgett's vision. And when he died in 1810, the leaders of this community, known as Derryfield, decided that in honor of Blodgett's vision about that industrial city, they changed the name of the community to Manchester. And we have been that since 1810. So yes, it is directly tied to Manchester in England. So there's that connection. But it was Blodgett's vision that ultimately brought that to life. That was the commercial canal. Keep moving. Oh, there's more. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Is that where that came from? There were three straws, each of whom was the agent or CEO at Amazon. Okay. okay. Yeah. So what? Uh, I'll keep a moment. So uh, sometimes when people you describe the milliard to them as all these red brick buildings, uh, they envision this Dickensian trap where you would go to work with the grudge and the grime. Amoscape wanted to avoid that. They'd seen the squalor in cities like Manchester in England, Liverpool, and they did not want to replicate that here 
It didn't fit with their vision of this utopia they wanted to create. So if you look around the mill buildings, you'll see surprising grace notes all around you, things that did not have to be done. Look at the brickwork and the filigree and the gentle curve. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a beauty. And yeah. it just fits the talent of the masons in these mill buildings. And the question I always get is, where did all the bricks come from? <laughs> yes, the sand in the Merrimack River is too fine because it had been you know, pummeled by the falls, so you couldn't get them to come together as bricks. Hooks, it had an, a vast array of clay beds that allowed them to manufacture the bricks right there in Hooks, it. They'd be put on a barge and brought down the river here. By way of example, the Jefferson Mill, the, one of the beautiful clock tower at the, at the north end of Milliard, that one building has more than 8 million bricks in it. So I'm not really good at math, but if you extrapolate that to the 75 mill buildings that were once a part of the intact Amoscape, you get some sense of the scale and scope. How many people made their living to making bricks? Uh, you know, it, this wasn't a cottage industry. This was a big, big economic enterprise. But again, when you look at those grace notes, now you may see the four rosebuds just above yeah. the lower level window. And you know, people see those now. Yeah. So as the course of bricks went up and we come to the floor, they had a bent metal object with a, a clasp on the end. They would hammer that pointed end into the floor, and then as the course of bricks went up, they would thread the cap onto the tie rod. So if you've been paying attention in all these years, there's the rosebud, the star, and the diamond. And those are the, uh, the three patterns they chose. They repeat throughout in the Milliard Museum as a design element. But here, it's much more than that. It's a foundational element of the building stability. If you have 800 looms going simultaneously in that building, it was like a mini earthquake every day. So that simple uh, engineering step, we talk about form and function when you talk engineering, that is both. Uh, it helps the stability of the buildings and also uh, adds that nice decorative touch. Okay. Yeah. Things you don't see, even though you're looking at them. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So John, those are always on our building? Yeah. Yeah. And some of the newer buildings don't have them. Yeah. So one of the reasons the Milliard has become such a popular destination, it was a simple bureaucratic change. For more than a century, the Milliard was zoned for industry, period, nothing else. And when Ray Wazorek became mayor, he was approached by this young guy named Dean Kamen who wanted to buy a mill building. And he, Ray thought that was a great idea because they were going to manufacture. They were going to make segues, they were going to make slingshot water purification devices. So that was okay. But Mayor Wazorek felt that there were greater uses for the mill yard beyond simply industry. Now, as a city, we were strapped. We had this area for industry, we had the Brown Ave Industrial Park, and we had East Coast Industrial Drive, which is where I spent so many years at the Union Leader. So that's all we had for industrial land. So the city people fought changing the zoning here. But Ray Wazorek passed it. It was changed to multi-use. So now that explains why we have UNH Manchester, why we have cotton, why we have uh, Wombeck Mills with so many different businesses. There's a climbing gym in that building. I don't think our forefathers envisioned that when they were building these buildings. <clears throat> but it uh, demonstrates the adaptability of this space once that zoning law was changed. Some of you I know have been here in the 60s and 70s, and you know what the mill yard looked like at that time. You could fire cannons off here and nobody would notice. The buildings were old and decrepit, and that question from Dean Kamen is what started the resurgence here in the mill yard as a destination. Right now, and Ralph Sidora knows better than I, the vacancy rate in the mill yard now is about 2%. So everybody wants to be in the mill yard. We actually had to relocate our collection. Ralph was a, a benefactor of us and rented us great space at 150 Dow at an extremely low rate. Then he sold the building to Bill Binney. And the rate went up eight times. $8,000 for the same space that Ralph let us have for 1000 So we had to relocate our entire uh, stored collection to a place outside of the mill yard because we simply can't afford to pay those rates. And Dean came and keeps buying them up, so I don't know if it's going to go down anytime soon. So This decorative thing here, this awning, <clears throat> I just pointed out because uh, you'll see those very unique uh, irons that hold the awning up. If next time you walk up Merrimack or Middle or Market Street, pay attention to the architecture of those row houses. That was the original worker housing that Amoscade built, you know, for those Franco-Americans who were coming here. 
and it repeats in every storefront and it just has a beautiful unity of design that you've probably walked by 50 times and not noticed. Also in those buildings, pay attention to the shutters. Any wood is painted what is known as amasket green. It's a specific color the company wanted to propagate throughout the community, just again for that uniformity of design that would give Manchester this harmonious look whether you paid attention or not. So the awnings and the decorative lights, obviously those were gas lamps at one point. <clears throat> and light's a big factor. Look at the windows. Look at how large the windows are in these buildings. Uh, there was a reason for that. In 1831, there was no artificial illumination other than candles or lamps. The problem when you're manufacturing cotton fabric is this dust cloud rises up in the air of all the tiny fibers. And if you had a, a candle lit, it would illuminate, boom, shoot the fire right down the roof. The original mills were built with a pitched roof. Why? We live in New England. It snows. They're far more capable of holding the weight. But when they saw the flaw in that design, they retrofitted all the mill yards, so, all the mills, so they had flat top roofs. We'll deal with the snow when we have to, but let's not have a fire that uh, kills or injures a lot of people. <clears throat> we were very fortunate with Amoskeg, and we, we had some industrial accidents. Obviously, everybody, uh, industry will go through that, uh, but not like Lowell. Lowell had the infamous Pemberton Mill fire. Amoskeg's buildings are all built with wooden beams. That's by design. But in Lowell, they decided to use cast iron beams to hold up their building. And apparently, one of them was flawed. It happened to be on the fifth floor of a five-story building. And when that metal pole collapsed, the entire building pancaked. All five floors were compressed into one. 500 people were killed in the building while they were working. But it got worse. When they came to try to rescue the people, as it got dark, they brought lanterns. Somebody kicked over a lantern. The entire building wreckage was on fire and more people were lost from the fire than were lost in the original building collapse. So Amoskeg's credo was always to use wood, which has some give to it, uh, just as the tie rods keep the building sturdy. That gives them a little bit of flexibility. So again, really smart people uh, were behind the building of these buildings. Okay. John? Yes? Steve O'Reilly knows it also. Um, one of the big benefits of having these large wooden beams is they take a long time to burn through. Right which means that, that if there is a fire, the building is not going to collapse because the post collapsed. Mm -hmm. When you use metal, if it gets hot enough, metal will flash out. Yep. So again, smart people. But again, the windows were built that large because for the first 50 years, there was no electrical illumination. You couldn't have candles, so you, de you depended upon natural light. And that's why you see all these buildings uh, with these great, great windows. This is now residential, by the way. This is the lofts at 300 Bedford Street, and this is a Brady Sullivan project. Another benefit of that zoning change, we can now have people living in the mill yard. Uh, it used to be that at five o'clock, you'd come down here and there'd be nobody. And now there are people here, you know, patronizing the restaurants and the bars, and just giving a real vitality to the mill yard that it didn't have for so, so many years. What do you call these, the design? Oh, those are the diamonds. Dot, oh. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I didn't name them. They yeah, didn't. yeah. <laughs> here we are again at another uh, great gathering place here in the mill yard. This is uh, the Mill Girl Plaza. It's called Stark Crossing <clears throat> because this is Stark Street. And Stark Street continues down to the river. Uh, but the Mill Girl statue is what I wanted you to see because uh, her name is Millie, by the way. Go figure. Uh, some really clever person came up with that for the mill girl. <clears throat> She's representative of all those Franco-American girls who came here, left their families at home in Canada, and came here to work in the mills. I mentioned the housing circumstances. They, single women lived in basically a house with a den mother in the corporate housing you see up on Market and Main and Middle. And her, her job, no men, no alcohol, no tobacco, was designed to keep the girls safe. That was part of the promise the company made to their parents when they lured them to come here with the promise of a job. Now, that is a big part of the Industrial Revolution, was moving people from agriculture to industry. If I sound like a history teacher, stop me, okay? Uh, but it was a major uh, development in different lives. So one of the concerns was these young, innocent girls were leaving the farm and coming to the big city, this industry. And so it, it worried people. They didn't know what the sociological consequences would be. But leave it to Manchester to punctuate that in such a way that no one could ever forget. Two young ladies who had come here from Canada uh, got together, donned white dresses, 
and threw themselves into one of the canals and committed suicide, joint suicide. They had been wronged by men, but nobody focused on that. They focused on these two innocents who perished. And how did that come to be? What was the effect of moving from a farm to an industrial city, engaging in a completely different kind of work in a foreign environment? It became a touchstone around the country. There were books written around this joint suicide pact, which was conducted in Manchester. And so, you know, it was, again, cautionary tale. Uh, people paid attention. And so Amoske redoubled its efforts to help support these young people, especially young women, epitomized by Millie. Now, I, I got to ask you to be careful here, because the pavement is not great. I don't even really want you to look at the plaza itself, because <clears throat> it's in such bad disrepair. This is one of the really cool gathering places in the mill yard. Normally, my friend Mark Doobie would have his hot dog stand right over there, but he's a Monday through Friday guy. He doesn't work on weekends. Uh, so people gather here, you know, from all the different mills. Like you, they want to get outside on a beautiful day, have a hot dog, sit on the steps, and chat with friends. And so Mark's been able to do that throughout the pandemic. He still comes, and people respectfully spread out on the stairs. But if you look at the disrepair, you know, that's a sin in an area that is, is so vital to the economic success of the city and social success. So I am part of a group with Dia called Manchester Connects, and we're all volunteers, and we've been engaged in a number of projects uh, to do things for the city that the city wouldn't do for itself. When we go to Arms Park over here, you'll see the beautiful furniture we installed uh, two years ago, as well as uh, dining tables and other things, so people will use the river more. This is our next project. We have an allocation of about $350,000 to entirely reconstruct the plaza. Millie will stay where Millie is, because she likes it there, uh, but the rest of this will be transformed. This is not handicap accessible. If you come down Stark Street with the intent of coming into the mill yard, you, you have to navigate the railroad tracks, number one. There's a path down the tracks that is not handicap equipped. I had to help a woman with her baby carriage a couple weeks ago. And then you get here. There's no way down here. Uh, so part of our mission is to make it more accessible. Mark will stay. We already right, we designed the plaza around Mark selling hot dogs. Uh, but it will be just a, a real shining light for Manchester to have uh, in a space where we really need to have it. Um, well, actually, we got grants, and so it, it, the price is going to be covered. The city had some uh, community development funds that they're going to apply to it, and yeah, when we need money, we'll you'll know. <laughs> Congratulations! It's like a boulevard. Was that one of the? Was there one of the uh, foot? The foot bridges? Was that one there? No, it's actually just a little bit uh, south of there. Okay. But yeah, it's a great shot right down to the river. So we're going to try to cross here and hopefully not lose anybody. Uh, the M you see painted on the ground here, uh, back a couple years ago, Manchester Connects did a walking tour of the mill yard. We called it the Loop. Started on Elm Street, came down here, and we marked cultural highlights by that M so you know what's this. We gave walking tour guides so you'd look and see what it was. What this is, is that paint on the wall. That's the high water mark from the flood of 1936. Wow. Now, when I started talking about the canals, uh, we had upper and lower canals. This was the lower canal. The water actually flooded completely across the lower canal. The water was 17 feet over the top of the dam at one point during this flood of 1936. It came in the spring in March. The snow was melting in the mountains. We had 11 straight days of rain, and the Merrimack was absolutely out of control. It took out every bridge in Manchester. The utilities, phone lines, everything went, not just pedestrian traffic bridges. So that's the high water mark. And it was elemental to this failure of Amoskit because they had filed for bankruptcy in 1935, we'll talk about the economics later, but hoped to reopen. And then three months later, in March of 36, that flood comes through and that killed Amoskit right there. That was it. They were done. So they filed for complete bankruptcy and it came at a, such a low time, 1936. There was this thing called the Depression going on and it revealed Manchester's true colors in ways I'll talk about in a little bit. High watermark. <laughs> Dean actually landed a couple of, a couple of years ago when I was doing one of these. He came in on a oh. <laughs> That stopped the tour dead. You know, John, do you know, like, July 4th, there's not a history of old home days. Yes. Do we do that here? Is there an old home day, or do we just do that? No, it was actually, old home day was started by Governor Frank Rollins of New Hampshire in 1899. Really? Uh, because 
there was a brain drain. Oh no, it started here. There was a brain drain going on in New Hampshire. People were leaving to go to work in the cities, and he wanted them to come home. Think about the movie Doc Hollywood with Michael J. Fox, where he gets reacquainted with small town life. And so that's what Governor Rollins wanted them to come home, understand and appreciate greater the benefits of living in New Hampshire with the hope that they might come back here and live and work. We should initiate that again. It was a great idea. It really was. Okay, so, you know, what was the idea? well, old home days. Old home old day, but, right. you know, John, so. I, I don't know what, what you call it. I don't have much going on. I could do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so here we are at the Merrimack River, and again, that 1936 flood uh, is present every day in Manchester, even though it was nearly a century ago. If you look to the south, uh, you see those granite stones in the river. That was a pedestrian bridge that allowed workers from the west side to come to the east side of the river. If they were here, if they weren't on the other side, they didn't have to. That bridge was taken down by the flood. The stanchions to the north, it's like, the mill building that stood right here, right flush with the river, was called Arms Textile. And there's more to that story. They actually generated the steam here and sent it via pipe across the river to power the mills that were on that side of the river prior to the construction of the highway, the ever turnpike. So that went out. The McGregor Bridge also known as the Notre Dame Bridge in more recent years. The McGregor Bridge was a predecessor of the old arc bridge that was there. That was taken out by the flood as well. Now, most of the communications lines ran under the bridges, like telephone lines and power lines. And with that entirely cut off, uh, there was no communication across the river. You couldn't pick up the phone. My dad was a Boy Scout. His troop used semaphore flags to communicate with people on the other side of the river. That's how primitive it was. Largely with law enforcement in case there were places they needed to go for rescue and firefighters as well. So that was a big deal. Now, some of you may remember the bridge of a more recent vintage. I called it the Notre Dame Bridge, which was a huge source of pride for the French Canadian community. They built it after the flood had taken out the McGregor Bridge, which the Scots-Irish had named. So now it's Notre Dame and it means everything to them. Now they want to get across the river, 1936, when they could find work. They can't. The bridges are out. Now, allegedly, there was a senatorial campaign going on featuring Senator Stiles' bridges, which I find ironic, uh, and a gentleman named John L. Sullivan. John L. Sullivan was the Democrat, Irishman, uh, former Secretary of the Navy, also publisher of the Union Leader. Senator Bridges was a really staunch conservative. And you think politics is dirty these days? It is alleged that Stiles' bridges people communicated to the French Canadian community about the construction of the bridge and basically that Sullivan was against it. Why? He said if the frogs want to go to work they can hop across the river. <laughs> Don't put that on TV. <laughs> that, I think you all know that uh, French Canadian people were derogatorily referred to as frogs. Uh, I was a mill rat because my mom and dad worked in the mills. We had derogatory names for everybody. That's just how life worked even back in the 50s and 60s. So the beautiful bridge came down in 1989. There was a late, unfortunately, a late effort to try to preserve it. Uh, Dean came and was heavily involved in that. His thought was to cut it down and float it down the river and maybe reinstall it at the site of the pedestrian bridge over here. But again, it was late to the game and they went forward with the uh, destruction of the bridge. And I photographed it for the union leader and they made me photograph it from this side. I'm a native west sider. I was always terrified I wouldn't be able to get home. I wanted to shoot it from the west side, but they wouldn't let me. So <laughs> I survived that trauma, but it was real. So Now, if you look behind you at the street sign, you'll see Stark Street. Obviously, that's for General John Stark. But the other street, Mungle Street, you mentioned that he was dead. Originally, it was going after volumes when they needed employees. They needed big numbers. Well, eventually, they realized they needed skill sets that were very critical to their work, and there might be more available talent elsewhere. For example, the foundry, the machine shop for Amoskeg, was manufacturing everything from those giant uh, turbine blades to you know, that massive chimneys. So they went to Germany 
and recruited engineers and machinists from Germany because they were the leaders in the world at that time, in the 1840s and 50s. So Manchester had a very large Germanic community, which a lot of people don't realize. Uh, it was more centered around Granite Square and Second Street, but the northwest of Manchester was the largest concentration of Franco-Americans. Interesting if you haven't noticed, uh, Amoskeg stopped developing housing after the corporations were all done in the overseers' homes. So on the west side, when it was time to develop for people to come and live, they actually sold land to private developers. One of them was a gentleman named Roger G. Sullivan, who owned the R.G. Sullivan Cigar Factory. <clears throat> he was from Bradford, New Hampshire, but had come here to make his fortune, eventually running the largest cigar manufacturing company in the world. Well, he was the developer on the west side. And as the west side started to grow, it became apparent that that was going to be a haven for the French speakers. It was called La Petite Canada. And so Roger Sullivan was a smart guy. When he started naming the streets, because he got to do that on the west side, he chose names that would sound pleasing to a Franco. Cartier, Dubuque, Notre Dame, uh, Alsace, Laval, Joliet. And that was part of Roger Sullivan's genius. Whereas here on the east side, we have trees. Pine, Maple Beach, Chestnut, and all that. He decided to go with a more euphonic name for the streets. <clears throat> so Andrew Mungle was a Scotsman. Now, the textile industry in Scotland and Great Britain was far more advanced than ours. We stole most of their technology, but we didn't have the skill sets people needed. He was also a dyer. He was the first Scotsman to come and work at Amoskeg uh, to create just those right colors because the t uh, fashion was changing. We're not all wearing drab black anymore. You're making gingham dresses, which need bright colors. So Andrew Mungle was among the first Scotsmen to come here. <clears throat> In the Milliard Museum, we have one of his handwritten recipe books to create just that certain you know, light blue or that pink. And it was a fascinating thing. So as a pioneer, um, Mungle has a street named after him here in the Milliard, which is kind of cool. So his skills, the German skills, a different kind of recruiting and workforce development taking place now. Questions? <clears throat> down, what did people do in the interim? Um, down by the Queen City Bridge, they actually had ferries. And I'm not talking, you know, 500 passengers. I'm talking rowboats. And that's how people would cross the river. In fact, uh, one of the great tragedies in Manchester history occurred before the Queen City Bridge was built. <clears throat> Families who lived on the west side, let's say you worked at what was the McKelwin Shoe Factory. It's now the Sundial Center where Hester College was for so many years. If you worked there, you would have to walk all the way down 2nd Street to the Granite Street Bridge, walk across, and then walk two more miles down to get to work. So a cottage industry sprung up. People with boats started ferrying people across the river. And you know they'd come back at 4 o'clock and bring you back the other way. In the dead of winter, they were doing that. <clears throat> and one family, the Stewart family, they were Scotsmen, uh, five of them were in a boat going across the river. And a rogue ice flow came by, pierced their boat, and the boat sank to the ground, four died. They were within 10 feet of the shore, but the water was so numbingly cold and such a shock that four died and one 18-year-old survived. So after that tragedy, the Scott community, Scottish community in Manchester went berserk. They wanted a bridge at the south end of Manchester so people could make that journey without having to walk four miles or the treachery of trying to take a ferry across the river at any time of year. So the city finally said, okay, we're gonna build a bridge. And then the big thing was, what are we going to call it? So the mayor at the time, Damas Caron, uh, we alternated Irish and French mayors for much, most of my life, uh, decided they were going to have a naming contest. So the union leader was all in. They had all these ballots coming in wanting to name it. The Scottish community was having none of it. They wanted the bridge to be named after the Stuarts who lost their lives, and it was their sacrifice that made the bridge become a reality. So Mayor Caron had a secret meeting with the alderman at City Hall and came out and announced that it was going to be called the Queen City Bridge. To the outrage of everybody on the west side, but uh, to this day, it's called the Queen City Bridge. But I read all the entries, and they were hilarious, what people wanted to call it. So we had Queen City. That's that. So, Right now, again, Manchester Connects, that group in which Dee and I are involved, we're talking about rebuilding a pedestrian bridge across the river. Ideally, it would leave from here and go on a diagonal and come up at Foundry Street, which is where if you step off, you'd be looking right up at Catholic Medical Center. Uh, and we're not talking about a footbridge like you may be thinking. This is going to be a substantial engineering project. Yes? <coughs> yeah. Um, in 1938, we had the great hurricane here. Uh, surprisingly, it was like a one-day phenomenon. I mean, there was a huge cleanup. 
uh, Pine Island Park, the amusement park in the south end of Manchester, was devastated by all the uh, pine trees coming down on all the rides. So they were put out of business for a couple of years. Uh, most of the logs were harvested and taken to the ledge at uh, Dairyfield Park. The Emmeskeg Ledge was a famous diving spot. It, it was a granite quarry that filled and had these incredible cliffs. My grandfather was one of the brownies. And the city thought, well, we had rid of all these logs. Let's put them in the water so the kids won't jump off the rocks anymore. That was really a good idea until about two years later when they get sufficiently waterlogged to start sinking. And basically they were like depth charges to any kid who was crazy enough to try to swim there. So yeah, the Hurricane of 38 didn't have the same devastating impact. This was economic, sociological, you know, every facet of Manchester life was touched by the flood. So, questions? I see. Did you have a question? No? Nope. How long was it before the Oh, four or five years. Uh, you know, just look at the engineering that was involved in building that bridge. You know, just because of the, the rise on the east side of the river, that's why it had to go, you know, up high to meet that. Now, do any of you ever cross the Kelly Street Bridge, the Byron Bridge? Sure. Do any of you remember when it had a curve in it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right. yeah. When the city started building the bridge, uh, they just started here on the east side, and as they made their way across, they never bothered to negotiate the purchase of the land on the other side. <laughs> and the landowner, this is my ticket. <laughs> I'm going to cash in here. So they actually altered the engineering plans to put a curve into the bridge. Now, it was in Ripley's, believe it or not. It is believed to have been the only curved bridge in the world. And as a kid, I used to run across that. My friends in Punard will go see them. They were boards missing in the sidewalks, yes, and it's 90 feet down. <laughs> and people went off the bridge. Uh, 1930, my dad was in fourth grade, 1934. His fourth grade teacher from the Ash Street School was driving home to Goffstown in an ice storm. <clears throat> and she went straight through the curve, through the rails. The car did a complete flip and landed in the river 90 feet below. And she survived insult to injury. When she recovered, they realized she lives in Goffstown. You can't teach in Manchester if you don't live in Manchester. So she got fired. <laughs> oh, no. 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 Absolutely, yeah. That was terrible. It was terrible. Oh, <laughs> but true. Again, fact checking. <laughs> <laughs> so meet my good friend Ralph Baer. Uh, I had an idea a few years ago. We put in a wall of fame at the museum, and amongst the 48 people on that wall of fame was my very close friend Ralph Baer. Uh, Ralph was an engineer, worked at Sanders Associates. Uh, he was born in Germany, fled when the Nazis came to power, uh, lived in New York, went to school in Chicago, and eventually came here to work in Nashua with Sanders. He was working on a project about, uh, like a flight simulator, using a television. So he hooked all these electronic things up to the TV and he was playing with it. And in the process, he invented what we know today as the home video game. Not the arcade games, the home video game. So if you have a Magnavox Odyssey or any one of those, Ralph invented the prototype. It was called the brown box. He's actually holding a replica of the control console he had. Uh, and I thought this guy's story is great. His son found out about him being on our wall of fame and came to see me. He lives in Salt Lake City. And he, we started talking about his dad and I said, I want to build a statue to your father. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm serious. I said, we should have a statue for Ralph. The inventor of the home video game, the Smithsonian has recreated his basement lab in Washington right down to the cardigan sweater on the back of the chair. I got goosebumps because I used, Ralph lived on Mayflower Drive in North Manchester by the VA hospital, and I lived just down the street, so I would go visit him. He asked me to help him write a book. <laughs> I speak English, I don't speak Ralph, so that was not gonna happen. So ultimately he did get a book published, which is very technical, and he became a rock star. He got the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he was celebrated in Vegas at the Star Trek conventions. He became a, you know, an Elvis to all these techies. So we raised $68,000. Um, BAE Systems is what acquired his original company, Sanders Associates. And they were opening a new office at what is now the Pine Island Park area with about 800 employees coming to Manchester. So I thought in my fundraising efforts, wouldn't they like to make a public relations splash when they move their new company to Manchester where Ralph had worked? five grand out of them so this is how extortion works if you know how to do it well it's not a crime so we raised sixty eight thousand dollars 
the, uh, the statue itself was manufactured in California using 3D technology because we thought Ralph would enjoy that. Yeah. So that's what the scope is worked with. And we unveiled it in May of last year. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah. The turnout was super, uh, you were here with me. And we had a party before and after for Ralph's extended family, people from Sanders. People came from the Smithsonian because they so admired Ralph. And you want to talk about pressure on your job? Run a museum and have people from the Smithsonian come visit. Oh my God. It's like pitching to Babe Ruth. <laughs> I got to do this. Uh, but they were thrilled. They contributed as well. So this is uh, the Manchester Connects vision is to increase activity here in the park, on the river. And we felt a tribute to Ralph would be a, a great way to get the old and the new because the new technology is driving the mill yard now. So you got Ralph sitting here and you get all these beautiful old mill buildings in the background. And I just think the juxtaposition says a lot about where we are as a community now. And if you want to know, my brick is the one next to his foot. <laughs> so I mentioned Simon, Teddy Ruxpin, you read that? That was Ralph's yes. invention as well. So oh, really? Oh, yeah, he did, yeah. A, he did a lot. And Magnum Box Odyssey was his patent. I, I take it back. Because he was working for Sanders when he made all these discoveries, Sanders owned the patents. So Ralph never realized any money. Think about the multi-billion dollar video game industry and the role Ralph played. And I hope this is reward enough for you. He was a modest guy, so he's got this. standing on the site of what was called Arms Textile. After Amoskeg went bankrupt in 1936, uh, it's a great story, I'll, I'll give you the abbreviated version. We have a movie tone newsreel that we show in the museum after Amoskeg went belly up. Uh, 1936, the flood comes through, what's going to happen to the mill yard? Amoskeg filed for bankruptcy, they were done. So the city fathers, the mayor, the newspaper publisher, uh, president of public service, now Eversource, got together and they went to the bankruptcy court judge, the federal judge, and said, how can we stop the mills from being auctioned off? He said, gentlemen, they were all men, the Amoskeg mills are worth $5 million. If you raise $500,000 by Friday, I won't put it up for bid. If you raise $4.5 million by the following Friday, you can have it. And they did it. Without ever leaving New Hampshire, they raised $5 million in 1936 at the height of the Depression, bought up all the mills. You couldn't cherry pick the ones you wanted. You got to buy the whole baby here. <clears throat> So they did it, and then they set, it, set about repopulating the mills with private industries rather than the one massive corporation called Amoskeg. So smaller companies were coming into these great mills, which are still in good repair, and one of them was Arms Textile. And Arms Textile stood here, where we're standing right now, and the building was flush with the river. That's why they could generate the steam and send it across on the pipe. Well, in 1954, uh, Manchester once again found itself the center of national attention. Uh, the men and women working there were shaving the hides of goat hair, goats that had been imported from Pakistan, goat hides. And in the process of doing so, without their knowing, they were releasing invisible anthrax spores into the air. And five of the workers inhaled them and died a very unpleasant death from inhalation anthrax. Others had contact burns on their fingers and their faces but were not as ill, but they were disfigured because of it. <clears throat> it shut down that day, total shutdown. The federal government came up and said, this isn't gonna happen again. So they put chain link fence around the entire building with barbed wire, all kinds of warning signs, stay away, hazardous materials, and it sat there, and it sat there, and it sat there. 20 years, that eyesore was here decaying in the mill yard. Can you imagine being the city's economic development director? and you're driving people through the mill yard because it was all zoned industry then. And he says, how about that? Oh, no, you don't want to go in that building. That's, that's the anthrax building. So finally, again, the urban renewal project that started in 62 and 72 and three, they were kind of winding it up, filling in the canals. And somebody said, what are we going to do about arms textile? So the CDC came in to oversee the demolition of the building. It was triangular in shape. It was this whole wall here veered off that way and came in the other way. They built an incinerator in the center of the triangle and they incinerated anything in the mills that would burn. All those lumber beams and all those hardwood floors were burned here. They didn't want to risk transporting the material, uh, increasing the possible spread. And then the guys came in in the hazmat suits. 
inside and out. They sprayed every brick in the building with bleach and chemicals, and you know the number of bricks we're talking about. And then they demolished the building very slowly. There was grave concern that if they went too fast, this plume would blow up into the air and the prevailing westerlies would take them right over to my house on Sullivan Street where I used to live. And so that was the reason behind the slow demolition. Then, wow, well, what are you gonna do with all those bricks when it's demolished? There was an area in the south part of the mill yard uh, that was known as Hobo Jungle. <clears throat> Why Hobo Jungle? All the trains that were coming in with all the raw materials for cotton and going out, all the metal for the uh, steam locomotives and the steam fire engines, it was a hotbed of activity populated by hobos, guys who would, the Willie Nelson song, you know, get on the railroad car and ride out of town with a kerchief on your stick on your shoulder. <clears throat> so they said, no one's ever going to use that, let's bury them there. They also found a place in Londonderry, which is now the home of Stonyfield Yogurt, and buried a bunch of the bricks there, and then they buried them here in Hobo Jungle. Well, a lot of them are buried here as well, under the uh, asphalt cap. So what now? Well, they made this a parking lot. When the mills were created, there were no automobiles yet for many years. So as the mill yard grew, parking became more of an imperative. So they decided to make this a parking lot. It's called Arms Park, but let's not kid ourselves, okay? It's Arms Parking Lot. So fast forward to about 15 years ago, somebody gets the great idea to build a baseball stadium in Manchester. Where are we going to do it? South end of the mill yard. You mean Hobo Jungle? Whoa. You know what's buried there? Before they put the first backhoe in the ground, the CDC came back to Manchester, conducted all kinds of soil testing, determined no remnants of anthrax. They found some nasty stuff. This was an industrial city, so there were heavy metals and solvents and stuff there, but uh, they got the go ahead to build the ballpark anyway. But next time you go to a game, presuming we will at some point, think about it when you order a hot dog. <laughs> but wasn't there uh, uh, like a soccer field there before they yes. tore that down? So yeah. they, didn't, they didn't worry about building a no, soccer No, they field. just they had grass and they just put a grass cap on it. Oh, okay. The bricks were still underneath it though. <laughs> and I remember that there was some controversy about taking away that field. Yes. To make it. <clears throat> yeah, it was Singer Field uh, when they originally built it. It's my understanding, John, that when they finished demolishing this area and, and, and covered it with asphalt, the first thing they did before they did any of that they closed it in plastic mm -hmm. and tossed gas, some kind of poisonous gas, <laughs> under the plastic and then sealed it and, and, yep. and told nobody to touch it for I believe it was two years. To leave it alone, yeah, stay away. They wanted the gas to <clears throat> and work through and kill all the anthrax. Yep. We have a great display in the museum talking about that period in Manchester's history. Uh, it was, again, like the joint suicide, it was nationally a subject of fascination. So the uh, the medical journals all came here. The army came here because it was concerned about possibly weaponizing anthrax. So the military was very involved in the closing of the mills at that very, right when the illnesses were taking place. So we don't know what they find. They don't make their findings public, but there was a lot of interest in that. So on September 11th, 2001, when people were receiving envelopes with anthrax in the mail, I started getting calls at the union leader to talk about Manchester. So I was at every TV network you could name, including Al Jazeera, to talk about Man Manchester's anthrax outbreak. We are the only context in the United States about what anthrax can do and what it did here. So, you know, it's another moment in the sun for me, but <laughs> I haven't got any fan mail from Al Jazeera. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a very real question. Uh, anthrax spores don't die. And, you know, as Ralph said, they, burning it, I suppose, is one way to eliminate it. But that's why we just signed a big federal deal with Massachusetts uh, about the Merrimack River. As you know, maybe you don't, uh, this was one of the most polluted rivers in the country in the 1960s. Uh, when Hunter S. Thompson, the gonzo journalist from Rolling Stone magazine, came here to cover the New Hampshire presidential primary, the lead to his story was Manchester, New Hampshire, a broken down mill town with a dirty river, an aggressive chamber of commerce, and the worst newspaper in America. <laughs> Having been associated with each and every one of those things, <laughs> I, t I take great pride in that when I see how far we've come, because that was in an article that came out last year talking about the miracle of the mill yard, how, how a mill town reinvented itself as a high-tech hub. <clears throat> So I appreciate what Mr. Thompson was trying to point out back then, especially about the worst newspaper in America. But uh, look at how far we've come.
And so now uh, with Massachusetts, we just signed a federal pact for about $368 million to eliminate storm runoff in Manchester. Anytime there's a heavy storm, our sewage systems can't handle the overflow and it goes right into the river. Just as it did when the slaughterhouse, uh, Jack Pack, now the river's edge, was located right near the base of the Queen City Bridge. Uh, they would discharge cow blood, cattle blood, right into the river. I played a baseball game at Bakersfield School, which is across the bridge, and I had to keep my glove over my face the entire game because the stench in that neighborhood was so overpowering. <clears throat> Walking home across the Queen City Bridge, look over the side, intact cow hides floating down river. <clears throat> it was disgusting. And so now, Lowell and Lawrence and Nashville use the Merrimack for drinking, drinking water. And this is, this is not apocryphal. My, one of my uncles played football for the great central teams in the 1920s when they were playing all the Massachusetts, you know, Brockton, Lowell. And one of the jibes from the Manchester players when they start jawing at each other is, don't worry, I'll flush twice tonight so you have enough to drink when you get home. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Years and years and years ago. <clears throat> yep. So we're moving forward now. Um, Chris Pappas and I can't think of the woman from Tierney, I think is her name, from Massachusetts, first term congressman. Those two got together and they made that happen. So the money will be expended over a period of about 20 years, but it will eliminate that storm runoff from Manchester, which is, again, going to help the water quality in the river. You, The river is clean now. You can swim in the river. Uh, friends of mine have boat up on the uh, up above the dam you do yep <clears throat> you would not have done that in 1972 or yeah or you would come out a different color you wore them when you went in <clears throat> yes yeah not related to the river, but related to water in the museum now. <clears throat> we have a great exhibit called Manchester's Urban Ponds. As you may know, there's a pond restoration program that's going uh, 20 years now. And so a young lady named Jen Drosiak approached us and said, would this be a suitable exhibit for the museum? And we said, hell yeah. So it focuses on Nuts Pond, Crystal Lake, which is a pond, even though it's called Crystal Lake. It originally it was called Mosquito Pond. I don't think the Chamber of Commerce had a say in naming that one. Uh, so Crystal Lake, Stevens Pond, uh, in my neighborhood, Doors Pond, has kept me sane over the last eight months just walking around the pond with my wife. So uh, it's a great exhibit. And again, focuses on what we've done to preserve them. Nuts Pond, some of you may know of, uh, is pretty much beyond salvation now, but they're, they're still trying. So good for them, and it's a great exhibit for us. Which was scheduled to open March 17th. I think you know what happened. <laughs> Tom Brady left. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day was canceled. I, I got a lot of grievances with March 17th of last year. <clears throat> well, I remember that, and they said that, what, in the late 60s, it was one of the six most polluted in the country, and they said it was the Rainbow River because all the shoe dye would just yep. be right. And also, it was right up there with the Cuyahoga in Cleveland that caught Which fire. caught fire. It was so polluted. <laughs> it burned all the bridges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they used to do it off the bridges. <clears throat> yeah, Granite Street Bridge had a grade in the middle. And, you know, we now know that's not snow. It's sand, it's salt, it's every other, you know, right. element you can think of. I was curious, do you ever get any calls from people in other areas of the country that are facing that sort of industry closing, moving out? If you have a Midwest, I mean, yeah. that's a good example of what you can do. It is. <clears throat> and another great example people cite is uh, Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, and they compare Manchester to Greenville. Uh, you, all the shops that are in here now, the you know, birthplaces for startups and artisans and craft people, glass makers, photographers, dance studios. Uh, this is the the ideal, yeah. and we still have to fight the perception of Manchester being a broken down mill town, yeah. which drives me crazy. So, the urban renewal thing was huge, <clears throat> because you know Manchester was an aging city. A lot of the buildings, the residential in particular, were wood frame tenements and they were in disrepair. So when Manchester was contracting it out in 1962, they went to a company called Arthur D. Little, which is still a huge consulting firm, and in the recommendations about Manchester's embrace of urban renewal, their recommendation said the mill yard will never be of aesthetic benefit to the city and should be demolished in its entirety. That's what you get when you pay for a Washington think tank to come offer ideas. 
And what that did, ironically, is it triggered a, a real interest in conservation and preservation here in Manchester. There were still bitter feelings toward Amoskeg in 1962. People who lost their jobs knew that the investors got paid off and they got nothing. So when the book Amoskeg, Life and Work in a Factory City came out, it largely consists of oral interviews with people who'd worked in the mills when they went bankrupt. So there's a bitterness that pervaded Manchester for all those years. And there were some people who cheered the thought of demolishing the mill yard. But others came to the fore and said, wait a minute, one in particular, a newspaper columnist, because they're the ones who all do good stuff, uh, named Ada Louise Huxtable, worked for the New York Times. She was an architecture critic, and she wrote this impassioned essay decrying the crime of herbicide that was being committed in Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm not talking about killing plants, it's herbicide, U-R-B-I-C-I-D-E. And <clears throat> it was unbelievably well written. Well, why do we prop up artificial constructs of history, like Plymouth Plantation, Colonial Williamsburg, they're gone. We've recreated a fantasy land. And yet here in Manchester, we're taking a wrecking ball to the manifestation of the Industrial Revolution in America. This is history. And my grandmother brought that to me. I was 15 and I was going to be a writer. She said, you need to read this. It's about your hometown. Game changer for me. All of a sudden, I came to recognize you know, what my hometown was about. That video I talked about, Manchester became branded the city that wouldn't die. And to be able to put that on your resume about your hometown, was a pretty cool thing. So all you see here now is are the fruits of that movement that was kindled in part by the Arthur D. Little Company and by Ada Louise Huxtable. Google her. I've actually found her being interviewed by Dick Cavett on the old Dick Cavett show. Yeah. Huxtable, like, yeah, like Bill Cosby and Cliff. Ada Louise Huxtable. Yeah, it's available online. You can read it. And it just, you know, it's become part of my portfolio. Everywhere I go, I tell people about Ada Louise Huxtable and the importance of that written piece which again has since spurred more. Uh, my friend uh, Aurora Eaton, my predecessor, has just written a great book called The Amoskeg Manufacturing Company, which we have in the gift shop at the museum. So it's again, it's the culmination of all these people coming together. 75 buildings, we still have 60 in the mill yard. So I think an 80% survival rate wouldn't be bad, uh, especially when it comes to a broken down mill town like Manchester. Never, heard, never utter that phrase again. <laughs> right. We're gonna cut across the parking lot. If you have any anthrax detectors, turn them on. So when we talk about the diversity of businesses in the mill yard now, uh, originally, 20 years ago, the University of New Hampshire at Manchester established itself in this building. Mayor Wazorek, once again, uh, they had started a campus over on Hackett Hill Road in Hooksett. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there. There's a great gum tree and cedar tree forest you can hike through. Uh, but when they built the campus, no one took into account the fact that if you start up Hackett Hill Road, there's a bridge overpass for the highway and nothing taller than 10 feet can get under the bridge. So their grand vision of creating an industrial park out there was shot because the only way out, you'd have to go all the way out into Hooksit to get back on the highway, and it was a bottleneck, literally, and that you couldn't get access to where you wanted to go. So he convinced them to come to the mill yard, and Dean Kamen at that time owned the Pandora building, which is at the corner of Granite and Commercial. To give you a sense of the collegiality that pervades the mill yard today, they managed to pull off a switch Dean essentially gave them the Pandora building, and Dean moved many of his operations into this one. No, Phil? He didn't give it to him. I, I, I know, it was, it was under duress. He did that. No, 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 no. There was money involved. There was money involved? Yeah. I'll talk more about Dean and money in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> Over here, you have the Stark Mill Brewing Company. It's not just that. getting chickens brought here for processing. I don't know if you know this, that Irving Singer was actually keeping chickens in the basement of the Stark Mill building. The only problem was the trains were still coming through the mill yard back then. So the chickens would all go to one corner and as soon as the train came by, they'd all rush to the other corner for protection. And he was losing a lot of chickens every day <laughs> simply by the train going through the, through the mill yard. But that's another story. So Stark Mill is there. That's the first legal brewery in Manchester in almost 150 years. It used to have a brewery here that was owned by a gentleman named True Jones. You may know the Frank Jones Brewery in Portsmouth. Uh, Frank Jones was a congressman. He built the Wentworth by the Sea. He was a really important guy. He had a younger brother, a big brewer on the seacoast still. And his younger brother, True, opened a brewery here in the mill yard. And his primary product was called Climax Ale. Fill in your own punchline. Um, but he really popular, sold a lot of beer. Talk about the hobo jungle. He fills his kegs, they go on the train, 
they go out all over the state to all the different bars, the wooden barrels would come back empty, mostly. They would park at the mill yard uh, in the hobo jungle area where all the trains were, and the hobos, the people who lived in that area, uh, found out that there were beer kegs in some of the train cars. So armed with hatchets, they chopped open the train cars, they chopped open the kegs, and they drank the dregs. <clears throat> it was known as scut, S-C-U-T. And it made them go berserk. So the Manchester Police Department would have to go down there because they'd start all kinds of vandalism and everything when they're literally out of their minds, drunk. And major riots occurred. They didn't want to give up their supply of scut. So, you know, people were going to the hospital with hatchet wounds and knife wounds. And that was part of the war of Manchester as a brewery, <laughs> brewing capital of the world. So, about what year was that? Uh, in the 1870s and 1880s. Yeah. And there, you've seen those big wooden barrels. You know, and that's the cork, and they take the pressure out. Yeah, they never quite got empty. You know, like, you never used to drink the last sip of the beer. <laughs> that's kind of what it was. Well, So among the many businesses in the mill yard, we just walked by Cotton Restaurant. And you should yep. definitely go there because it's owned by my sister-in-law. <laughs> and, and her husband, Jeff Page. <clears throat> so we've talked a lot about the history of the mill yard and what has transpired before. Now we're gonna talk about what's going to transpire next. Uh, we are stationed here at the front door to Army. That stands for the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute. All they're going to do there is manufacture human organs for transplant into living human beings. Piece of cake, right? Dean Cameron, yes, yes. So Dean came to see me about three years ago now, uh, came to the museum with his partner Maureen Tui, who's I think as smart as he is, um, <clears throat> and asked me if I'd give him a tour of the museum. Show me how Manchester became the largest textile manufacturing company in the world. He said, I know the story, but I need to get a refresher. So I took Dean and Maureen through the museum for a couple hours, they ask really hard questions, most of which I could answer, <clears throat> thankfully. And he explained to me afterward, the reason I want to do this is I've been invited to come to Washington to see if we would be interested in taking on a new project to manufacture human organs. And I said, Dean, you're kidding me. He said, the only difference between science and science fiction is time. And now is time for us to be exploring this. He showed me magazines from 20 years ago, the first robotic human being, the $6 million man, we aren't doing much of that. He's been doing it here with the uh, um, Next Step Orthotics and Prosthetics uh, manufacturing uh, artificial limbs for this, the men and women coming back with these horrific wounds from the war. This is a whole different ballgame. This is talking about creating human organs for transplant using DNA technology, 3D printing, anything you can imagine. And one of the beauties of this is every three months they have a quarterly summit here in Manchester. And I like it because I get 400 of the finest scientific minds in the world at the museum when we can let 400 people in. We can't do that anymore. Um, but Dean will grab me and say, John, those guys are from NASA. Let's go show them how the water worked in the mills. I'm like, all right, NASA, NASA it is. J John Deere, name a company, they're all there. So this is their vision and this is the mission. Dean wants to make the mill yard, once again, a manufacturing center of the world, but not with textiles, with human organs. So applaud his vision. Uh, much of the reason the milliard is looking like it does, because investors like Ralph came in early. Um, Warren Buffett actually bid on the Wombeck building, and he backed out. Arthur Sullivan had too much money. He had the building. He did have it. Okay. No, no, we had the building. Oh, you did. He didn't invest as such. The company moved to Manchester in 1940. Yes. What? Let's call the Pandora building in 1949. Bought 150 down in 1966, I believe. Mm -hmm. And went after Pandora went out of business, my mother kept the real estate and we redeveloped. Oh, you did? That, that building, we gave to Pandora Manchester Mental Health. Mm -hmm. And they sold it to Dean two years later. Oh.
So again, this is the future of the mill yard you've seen in the past. That's part of the future of the mill yard. Can't tell you I'm loving it. Uh, that is the first complete building to be built in the mill yard since 1915. Now people often ask me about the parking garage that was just built at the south end. Uh, that is not part of the Amoscape contiguous land. Yeah, it's south of what was designated Amoscape. WMUR, how about the new TV station? That's on the grounds that was owned by B&M Railroad for the train station. So again, when we say the mill yard, it's a very specific contiguous piece of land. The last building in 1915 was 540, 560 North Commercial Street, which Dean just bought. And the, the building before that, built in 1915, was the bag mill. And what they were doing is they were simultaneously demolishing it and building it at the same time. So it was a really interesting uh, process that they went through for that building. So multiple tenants in there. Martin Yeti, the wine company, my wife used to work for them there and there. Uh, and it was recently sold. Uh, Dean bought it about a year ago. And he got special permission from the city to convert some of that to residential as well, uh, claiming that his employees are millennials, they don't need cars, they're going to walk everywhere they go, they won't be sending kids to the schools, so the taxes won't be impacted by that. So we got permission and a, kind of an exemption to create 39 residential units at uh, 540 commercial, North commercial. What about across the river? How, how are those um, they're, they're in really good shape. Uh, the mills at Lofts at Mill West are in the building that used to be Amoscape's flag factory. That's where they actually manufactured that great flag. You may have seen that historic photograph, which we recreated a few years ago with Brady Sullivan. And that was a nice opportunity because they reached out and asked me if I would help them with the context of the original photograph. And a, day, a week does not go by when someone comes in the museum and shows me their grandmother or grandfather in that photograph. So I love it. It's like a Where's Waldo game, but with relatives. So they asked if I would be of help on that project to unfurl a 90 by 50 foot flag that's new. Uh, and I said, sure, I'm happy to help. So we're thinking about the 4th of July. <coughs> I said, how about Flag Day? And the guy said, what's Flag Day? <laughs> I said, well, it's June 14th. It's been around for a while. And so we changed the date to June 14th, which happily was a Friday. So they agreed to leave the flag on display throughout that long weekend, which was great. The unfurling was amazing. Yes. Originally, it was just going to be in place when you got there. That wasn't dramatic enough for Arthur Sullivan. He wanted it to be unfurled. So my friend Scott Arberton from First Science said, OK, we'll give it a try. It was a little breezy that day. Some of you may have been there. It was yes. an unbelievably beautiful day, like today. Yeah. And it was unfurled, and it was you know tied down in all the right places. And I talked about the history of the original flag, and it was great. And Arthur was going to talk after me. And when I finished and started walking away, he called me back. He gave me a check for $10,000 for the museum, just for my help in that process, uh, which, you know, gladdens my heart. And we, I couldn't yes. speak. He said, you want to say something? I said, I got nothing. I can't talk. This, is, this would not be a good moment for me to get to the microphone. So it, again, it just shows you the interconnectivity of all these different businesses in the mill yard. I tell people the mill yard's a living, breathing thing. This is not a museum. This has to ebb and flow with the times. And that's what will keep it a living, breathing thing. If we try to embed it in amber, it's gonna die. So we have to accept things like this that might not be our first choice. Um, but to their credit, they reached out to me and asked me, uh, they're gonna do a mural inside the building, which I've not seen yet. And they asked the people I would mention should be you know, historic figures from Manchester's past. So I'll be intrigued to see if they're gonna be good neighbors and do that the way they promised. Does the name have anything to do with the brewery? No, someone else asked me that. Uh, his name was T-R-U-E. I don't know what his parents were thinking when they named him, but uh, <laughs> True the Brewer, if you will. So yeah, that's some of it. I'm sure you have more questions, but uh, we can address them as we walk on. I'm just wondering about the ARMI, because I know that a lot of it was a Department of Defense yes. grant, was it? and I didn't know how that's connected with all the orders. And also, have they been successful, or since they were so concerned with recruiting enough yeah. brilliant minds to come? They're having some success. I mean, he would tell you they're 10 years away from having a transplantable human organ, but some of the advances they're making with blood science are really important, and they're working hard. One of his first hires was a gentleman named Richard McFarland, who was the former director of the Food and Drug Administration under a couple of different presidents. And when people come to work for Dean, he tells them, go see John. You have to go to the Milliard Museum. You have to know what makes this community tick. If you're gonna work here, I want you to have the context to understand why it's so important. 
And so Richard McFarland, the director of the Food and Drug Administration, is sitting in my office across me saying, what levels of membership do you have? And he said, well, we have this patron level way up here. That you might get. <laughs> and he's a regular visitor. He's, he's a sweetheart of a guy. Do you have specifications for, for the familiar <clears throat> people have to meet, industry has to meet? Um, I don't know what their standards are. I know that they're... I mean, I mean, the mill yard. Are there specifications? That, that we, we have a heritage commission, and if I could put that in quotes, I would. I don't think they're doing very well at their job. The parking garage, for example, was being built, and the heritage commission said, no, we don't like this. It doesn't fit in with the mill yard. And I agreed. And they had the engineer get in touch with me at the museum and said, we're going to put this um, metallic screen on the side facing the highway. And I said, why don't you put a photograph on it? And he was intrigued, so I said, the flag photo. I said, how about this picture of you know Manchester celebrating itself? And they said, okay, let me see what I can do. I sent him the image. He sent me back a PowerPoint presentation. The next week, we went to City Hall. We made a presentation to the Heritage Commission. And when he showed that, five zero in favor of using that image. And then somehow it didn't happen. Really? They claimed, I, Steve, you volunteered, didn't you? At Macy Industries, they said, oh, we couldn't do it, it's too expensive, it can't be done. And Steve's hooks a company, Macy Industry. he called me that day and said, we can do that. The developer was hearing none of it. Then it was too expensive. Then it, they used me to snooker the Heritage Commission to get approval for it, and then they didn't follow through with it. So you win one, you lose one. We just saved the Chandler House on Beach Street by the Career Museum of Art. Yep. Only took five years. And I think I've been excommunicated from the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> the bishop was not happy with me. <laughs> no, I just accused him of extortion, that's all. I don't know why he got upset. <laughs> so anyway, this is, this is our work, this is what we do. You know, we cherish uh, the place where we work. And we love it when folks like you want to come out and learn more about it. So I hope this has been in some way informative. Uh, if you've got nothing else going on after, please enjoy the museum. We do sell memberships. You'll be surprised to hear that. We don't get any city, state, or federal funding. Uh, so we depend on grants and wonderful people like you who support us. $30 for a one-year membership. Free admission to the museum throughout the year. We have exhibit openings when we can. Uh, and hopefully we will again. Uh, discounts in the gift shop. And make my job safer. So God knows I'm not asking for much. <laughs> okay, thank you, folks. Thank you. So one of you is going off that way. Oh, she's already gone. Okay. Uh, she's got to walk home, and she lives up this way. So as we make our way back to the museum, if you have any questions, make your way up to me. I'll put my mask on so I'm approachable. Although it, it is a Patriots mask. I definitely need to rethink this, the way they're playing. <laughs>